Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. This is Dean Woodbeck from Internet 2 and In Common, and you've joined IAM Online. Uh, IAM Online is a monthly webinar that's presented by In Common and sponsored by Internet 2 and also the Educause Higher Education Information Security Council. We're taking questions today via the chat. And if you click on your chat button, you'll see that the default is to send the message to presenters. If you could use that drop down menu and choose to send your message to everybody, uh, that way we can all see the chat and we can all see the answers. And uh, our moderator will be watching the chat and will pose your questions when appropriate. So without further ado, I'll introduce our moderator for today, Tom Barton from the University of Chicago and Internet2. Tom? Thanks, Dean, and hello, everybody. Uh, it's, uh... Uh, it's a great day here in the United States, I have to say. We're, we just had the inauguration and um, a new chapter is starting. It's be interesting to see where we go from here. But that's not our topic for today here. We are here to talk about the National Science Foundation uh, Campus Cyber Infrastructure um, uh, Program and their latest solicitation. And the specific reason why we're here is that the solicitation itself, the call for proposals, contains the italicized words in it, um, and that, that those refer to something um, that's an appendix to each proposal submitted to the CC Star program called the Campus Cyber Infrastructure Plan or Campus CI Plan, and this, this puts an obligation on, on the, whatever it is that you will put in your Campus CI Plan. They want you to address these things about in common. Are you registered with in common? Do you support the research and scholarship entity category? And do you meet the in common baseline expectations for trust and federation? So I'm going to unpack those things a little bit. And then subsequently, I'm going to turn it over to Clara Yankova from Bryce University, and, and then down to Mark Wallman from North Dakota State University, who are going to talk about their own CC star proposals and, and their reactions in response to, to this statement, among other things. So with that in mind, Dean, if you could uh, advance the slide. I'd like to kind of, I don't like to dive straight into unpacking. I'd like to start out by remembering for myself and for all of us, what it is we think we're doing um, that these elements uh, fit into. And you know, stand, panning way back out, um, it's all about collaboration and supporting research and scholarship across the academy. I like to use the singular proper noun, the academy, to remind us that for those types of activities, we are actually share a common mission across all of the different organizations uh, colleges, universities, research institutes, and the like around the world, frankly, uh, where we, you know, we may compete for resources and staff and students and faculty and money, but we collaborate uh, to help support all of those people do their research and scholarship and other academic activities. Those are those we have as common elements of our mission. And so this picture shows that they're all over the world. All the people are all over the world, all the data all the instruments, computing, all the things that they use to do their research and scholarship with, operated by thousands of organizations uh, across all those activities. And they're connected in particular by global research networks and by federation. Uh, and so in, in organizations like Internet2 and many others are focused especially on those latter two ways that those kinds of shared services that enable collaboration broadly, globally even. Uh, next slide, please, Dean. So let's just recall a little bit about federation or identity federations or access federations or authentication federations. I'm not gonna, there's a lot of different words that are put next to the one, uh, next to the word federation. The general idea is that there is in each country and in the US it's in common, there is a, a federation, an organization supporting the access um, to this a global infrastructure in its country in the, for the R&E, the research and education sector. What that kind of boils down to is that if you have a, a single sign-on system at your campus, and most do, it's a way to connect that technically into a larger fabric so that your campus logins that are used to, you know, for all the ordinary things people do daily at your campus can also be used for, by those same people to access the ordinary day things they do in their academic lives beyond your campus. And so that's the, that's the basic nature of it. There's technology, there's policy, there's organization. A lot of stuff goes into that, um, which I'm not going to dwell deeply on right now. There's uh, 
70 different countries at this point have them, and they're all kind of bound together by something called edge game. That allows the connections, the registration, the metadata, the, the stuff that people like Ann West and In Common do and her counterparts in 69 other countries to share and aggregate that information so that their members in each of those places can access um, services and have, have access to theirs from users from all over the world. Uh, and I do want to call out one thing about, about this, and that's that orange blob on the left that says research project connected by a hub or bridge or gateway or, or proxy or something. And that is to get the benefit of a campus user being able to access their collaboration resources with their campus credential. It's not necessary that the resource they want to access directly belong to Federation. It is possible, and in fact, quite common for a variety of very good reasons, that many of those uh, research um, uh, services that are never developed uh, to begin with to are equipped for federated access are given that by means of some kind of a proxy or bridge. So it extends the benefit into um, uh, uh, cyber infrastructures that themselves are outside of federation. So federated access goes beyond that global federated identity uh, infrastructure. So um, on the next slide, please. Now, about those research types, there was a lot of work done a couple of years ago uh, under the heading of FIM for R, Federated Identity Management for Research version two. And it's a paper, you'll see the citation at the bottom of the slide. And there's logos from a bunch of different research communities and scholarly communities that, per, that per work together for about 18 months to identify and report what's the most important stuff to, that they need out of Federation so that Federation access to their stuff to support their collaborations would work great. And uh, the next slide, I've encapsulated a picture that isn't from that report, but is my own in interpretation of, of all the different types of uh, requirements and requests that that report asked of various constituencies. I kind of gelled out, or uh, what, what it was, distilled out, I should say, what it was they really want from federations like in common, okay, that constituency. They want these things um, to enable basic collaboration. And so you can see in that green base of the pyramid, several different statements, one of which was or is mentioned in that NSF solicitation, the research and scholarship thing. Um, they want to support high value resources. And so that takes some further work. Um, and, and it's also that they can manage and reduce the risk that they have, um, that they accept by relying on campuses to provide to enable their users to access their resources using campus credentials rather than themselves having to create and manage user credentials for those, collabor those collaborations. Um, we'll come back to this in a minute, but let's move to the next slide next now, Dean. So that solicitation talked about baseline expectations and it talked about the research and education, um, research and scholarship entity category. I'll start with baseline expectations. And there's a link in this slide that you'll see when it's published on the slide to publish that you can click on that gives you all the details. But roughly speaking, this is the in common federations programmatic response to those needs articulated by the, the uh, research community in the federated uh, identity management for research uh, paper. Uh, and it's so it's a it's a policy, it's contract, contract language that are that participants and common participants agree to. Uh, it's, there's governance and process that goes into deciding how to address those various uh, steps on the pyramid. Um, and there's, there's a lot to say around all the formalism and, and so forth that goes into the baseline expectations program. But at the end of the day, the time spent, the real work, there's all this hands-on, a lot of communication, a lot of support work. And it's all about helping a thousand organizations manage change. You know, if we're going to, um, use the baseline expectations program to keep in common uh, federation valuable, meeting the needs of those research and scholarly collaborations. That implies that all of its members, as well as the in common federation operation itself, have to change from time to time to kind of keep the value um, high. And so that's what this is, is a program for managing change guided by the community to decide what changes they think are the next best one to, to, to um, uh, attempt. Next slide, please, Dean. So here's that pyramid again, and, but I've on the left kind of superimposed how far the baseline expectation program has taken us so far. And just to recall, 
there's been one complete iteration of work, one big work package, the initial one, V1, where we basically tackled that bottom thing. We cleaned up in commons metadata. It was awful. It's now perfect. It was, it had, there are many things that it failed to do in terms of user experience and interoperability and so forth that it does very well. It's cited as a shining example now amongst the worlds of national federations uh, for that. And just recently we concluded uh, a range of processes by whereby the in common com community followed those, one of those processes in the previous slide to decide that the next baseline, the one which has just started up, the next work package as it were, um, should address error handling and some basic security stuff, including things called certify and, and how good your endpoints that are in federation, your, your uh, single sign-on system and, and services, how, how well they handle um, 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 SSL basically. So those are now pieces of work and change management on, the, on that Indian Common Federation, all of the participants are beginning to undertake. We're just ramping that up all that support work right now. And we'll see where we go in the future. You can see there's all the other things left, uh, not yet encompassed within the baseline expectations program. I'll note that every single one of them is something that the National Institutes of Health will begin to require this year. And so um, that's something that we might talk about more, I think maybe even further on uh, IAM online, as we have talked about in some of the conference materials uh, lately. Uh, next slide, please, Dean. So what is that research and scholarship attribute release or entity category business, what's that all about? And it's, it's kind of straightforward really, um, uh, deceptively perhaps. And that is that, um, you know, when users go and use Federation to access a service, especially in, a, in an academic collaborative context, very often in those contexts, they need to know a few basic things to kind of make it, uh, to improve the user experience or to do some basic reporting like their name, their email affiliation, and a persistent identifier so that they can recognize the same person coming back over and over. Um, not a big deal, but quite important for making that the federated access work well. Can be a big deal because there's often concerns about releasing things like names willy-nilly to unknown people around the world, and that's reasonable. But that's why there's a whole program here called Research and Scholarship, which we'll get to. The idea is that, uh, that there are some research and scholarly service providers uh, and they're reviewed uh, according to established international standards that were very closely uh, developed um, by each national federation operator, so in common in the US. Um, if they meet the requirements for being considered um, a, a research and scholarship service provider, so they, they tend to be the things that you know, researchers and scholars use in their academic activities, not really enterprise kind of applications. Those are quite different. And uh, so they get, they get a tag someplace. They're identified to the Federation technology as so recognized by their national uh, Federation. And then identity providers at colleges and universities can opt in. There's a thing that they can do, whatever that is, some technical thing, so that whenever one of the users is attempting to access one of those tagged services that their identity provider will automatically release that, those attributes to that tagged service. And so those identity providers are also referred to as being RNS, that is they're participating in the program. And sometimes um, services want to know that before they um, let the user proceed into the far into the login process because they want to manage the user's experience to the best of their ability. Um, so that's a rough idea. It's a way to safely convey some personal information about users when they're engaging in their research and scholarly activities using Federation. And I will just uh, stop there by saying, and finish by saying that there was a lot of review done in, uh, in Europe about this program from the perspective of the European General Data Protection Regulation. And the, and the conclusion was that it actually contributes to good privacy practice because it's, it's helpful at limiting uh, data, um, you know, so it's a, it's a data minimization technique where it's okay under the GDPR to use attributes where they're needed in a, an appropriate way. And so this, this is what the RNS program does. It allows these attributes to flow to where they're needed in an appropriate way and doesn't where they're not. So that's sort of I, what I think that, you know, kind of digging into what the National Science Foundation's uh, 
requirements for the campus cyber infrastructure are when it comes to in common. And Clara, will you tell us what you're doing and Rice is doing in response to the letters in the station? Uh, thank you very much, Tom. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and I'll talk about the uh, RISE CC STAR grant. And I think one of the things that's important, um, Tom uh, provided an excellent overview of the technology, the underpinning technology uh, to federated identity and access management and the research and scholarship uh, category. But I think when you're thinking from a campus perspective about the CC STAR awards, it's very important to really think about the science drivers and what is the science that you're trying to support and enable through your, through your answer to the NSF, to NSF solicitation. So for us, for our CC STAR grant, we decided to focus on data intensive science and engineering. And the concept was deploying an interactive data analysis platform that would be connected via Science DMZ, which we already deployed, to community cloud resources, which, was, uh, which is the open science grid, which some of the projects are already using and also commercial resources. So we really saw it as you know, playing in both places. Utilizing containerization, uh, so uh, each researcher would have more flexibility. So really moving away from the more traditional HPC model to more containerized model. Um, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit when I go more into the science drivers why that was an important requirement for our grant. And it's also important to realize that we were building on existing investments that we have already made, either with the support of the National Science Foundation, such as the Science DMZ, but also being part of In Common, uh, being uh, uh, part of the RNS category, and having an information security center that is uh, dedicated to supporting researchers and in addition to just supporting the enterprise. Next slide, please. So in our science drivers, we had, you, you see how varied they are. And that's why thinking about containerization was an important element. It starts from, you know, image processing and modeling to high energy physics, you know, analysis of geophysical data sets, machine learning and computer vision. And what was important for us was to bring these researchers together and say, you have a problem that is from a, Compute, that computationally could use the same infrastructure if we can figure out how we can support your unique needs. And to illustrate that point, let me talk about two examples of these science drivers. Uh, next slide, please. And you will see how varied they are. So Dr. Tunnell's uh, is, uh, is an experiment that has to do with something super important for all of us, which is uh, dark matter that comprises 85% of our universe's mass. So figuring out, you know, studying it more in depth is uh, obviously very important. And it's actually one of the top five challenges in modern physics, as many people would agree. So the world leading experiment for directly detecting dark matter in the lab is Zionit, where Rice is the founding member of that, of that experiment. And Professor uh, Tunnell uh, is the longest serving analysis leader while also having developed uh, much of the software that is used by the experiment. And his research group really works on this interface between physics analysis and data science and really trying to uh, use this uh, for a data intensive measurement. So there's a meshing of kind of two areas together. So the limitation has been uh, of these methods that they're trying to develop. They're, so develop, they're developing these uh, algorithmic methods as the, at the same time as they're doing their physics experiments. Um, has been uh, in, in, uh, has have been the facilities, right? So that's where the even though the uh, the the uh, detector uses OSG for its uh, data processing, the GPU cluster, this interactive cluster, is going to be used to continuously process the stream of data and to also reprocess the entire data set. So that's an example. Uh, of, of one of the science drivers and how we are positioning this instrument that we are uh, lucky to be able to deploy with the support of NSF. Next slide. On the other side of the spectrum, 
is uh, computer vision uh, uh, where Dr. Virara Kavan, and I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing the name, but uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, Ashok will uh, for, forgive me, uh, really working on uh, computer vision and signal processing. And that's a you know, very active area of research for many researchers, of, um, many researchers on campuses, but also in private industry. Um, and there are more and more uh, reliable alg algorithms uh, for face detection, face recognition, and gaze tracking, which really is about where are you looking and are you looking at the right thing? And so um, kind of being able to automatically detect user identity and their screen viewing from either uh, kind of cameras mounted on top of televisions or cameras that are part of your mobile device or tablet is, is important and doing it with 95% accuracy is, is important for certain applications. Um, and so this, because the lighting and, and kind of your setting can affect the accuracy of those algorithms, uh, kind of the use of computationally complex computer vision algorithm is really kind of is, is based in uh, deep neural networks, right? And that means that there's massive amount of data uh, and in, in requiring um, in, increasing uh, horsepower and large scale CPU and GPU clusters. And so with this grant, we can support this research and we are able to move this research from being done primarily on desktops and being able, able, able to be done on a, in a shared environment. So those are just two examples of what we were, uh, of the science drivers that we have uh, been, uh, that were part of our proposals, the proposal, and you can see kind of they're very, very varied. Next slide, please. So where the federated access management plays a role, so as I mentioned before, RES is a longstanding member of in common supporting research and scholarship entity category. Uh, we use primarily open products uh, and uh, including Shibboleth and Grouper. I'm, I'm sure many of you are in the same category. And we also have a dedicated centralized identity and access management team that is going to work very closely with our Center for Research Computing on integrating federated uh, identity management services with this interactive data analysis platform. So I hope this kind of gave you an idea of what we are trying to do with our CC Star Award. We are in early, uh, early, uh, in uh, early moments, but uh, just you know, kind of giving you a little taste before I turn it over to Mark Wallman, who is the vice president for IT at North Dakota State University. Mark, take it away. Okay, well, um, thanks. I, I'm going to start with a confession. Um, I was unaware that there was an in common requirement for uh, CC Star grants until last week. We have been using it for quite a while at NDSU, and so it's not something I really even think of. Um, but then, as I'm so as I'm getting starting to reflect on our grant and what we're going to need it for and what we're going to be doing, um, it kind of became um, the, the need kind of became apparent to me because some of our partners are kind of sitting on the edge of this community. Um, and so even though we're fairly far along, you know, we meet all of the, if you go back to the, the diagram that Tom had shown before about base requirements and things, we got all the base requirements covered and we're uh, closing in on higher levels of, of uh, compliance and assurance. So um, anyway, so, so I, I wasn't aware of that and um, a lot of the stuff with regard to the in common elements of things with our grant ends up ended up being a little bit more um, messy. So um, the things that we ended up doing, and I think I have my I ended up having my slides in reverse order here, but um, here's what we ended up deploying what we were asking for as part of our grant collaborative grant. It's a collaborative grant with the University of North Dakota. And so we're deploying a science DMZ data transfer nodes and upgrading our network connectivity. Um, next slide, please. So um, the goals and why are we were doing this um, are uh, supporting our EPSCOR related activities. We're an EPSCOR state. Um, for those of you who don't know, that is a program for states that receive um, less National Science Foundation funding than others. And I don't remember exactly what the threshold are or what the threshold is for that, but it tends to be more rural states that are, that are EPSCOR states and there's uh, the EPSCOR uh, program targets NSF dollars at these states and research programs that are existing. So 
one of the um, drivers for us was to support these NSF activities at both uh, NDSU and the University of North Dakota. Um, uh, we wanted to facilitate uh, collaborations with public higher education institutions in the state of North Dakota. We have 11 public institutions. Um, the research universities are NDSU and University of North Dakota, and then also collaborations with our tribal colleges, and there's five of those. And the EPSCOR activities uh, also typically have a driver of participation from these smaller institutions. Um, also, as a note, just uh, in North Dakota, uh, collaborations of the research universities with these smaller regional publics is very much appreciated by the legislature. And so we have kind of some state politics driving us for collaborations in, the, in that direction. Um, and so the research programs, we did identify some specific research programs to target uh, precision agriculture and uh, agriculture is probably our primary area of, area of research at NDSU, polymers and coatings, um, and then up at the University of North Dakota, they were targeting um, climate studies. And so um, I think specific pieces of research were a little less prominent for us than it sounds like it was uh, at Rice. Um, and it was kind of more, uh, the intent was kind of some more support more uh, larger programs. Okay, next slide, please. So um, here comes my issue. So the, the collaborations with others uh, other research universities seems to go pretty well. I, th I think kind of the slides that Tom um, laid out indicate we kind of have a roadmap. We have community drivers that there are requirements from the National Science Foundation urging us to all be using in common is great. Um, the issue I'm finding myself in right now is that um, I have a number of small institutions that are kind of on the sidelines and you, have, you can see them listed in this diagram. So participating with other people, other research universities, connecting to national labs or getting access to services from some other service provider. I mean, we're in good shape on that. Um, it works well for us and it works well for a lot of other research universities. And the, um, but I've got these, these groups on the sidelines. So the yellow are our uh, tribal colleges and um, the blue are listed as our smaller regional public institutions. And so, um, it turns out that our, so if, uh, it turns out that they're not, I now find myself with two specific grant activities that I personally am involved in that um, I'm feeling it would be a lot easier for me if we were able to onboard all these other institutions. So um, our EPSCOR grant, we have some responsibilities. I have computational research under me and um, being able to move data amongst institutions, including these small ones that I have listed in the slides is an explicit requirement. We can still do it with our data transfer nodes and whatnot. It's just there's extra hoops that we have to jump through and hurdles, which is exactly what in common is supposed to, you know, pave the way for. Um, I also am participating in a grant with AHAC, the American Higher Education Indian Consortium, and, and we are working with these tribal colleges that you see in yellow on the screen to try and uh, upgrade their science, uh, cyber infrastructure so they can give better participate in science activities. Um, and I'm realizing as we've been doing research on where they stand on everything that they have a lot of hurdles to jump through before uh, participation would be viable for them. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, uh, I'll say, I, I think that a lot of the other activities where we do have people interacting with other national resources or other researchers at, at other larger universities um, that stuff all, uh, you know, we have all, all the infrastructure and, and things in place for that. Um, but here are the challenges I'm personally facing uh, participating in these grants right now. So um, there's a base level of identity management that's kind of missing at a lot of these schools, particularly at the tribal colleges. Um, just having a coherent identifier that's used consistently. People know, you know, one, people know what the password is. You don't have passwords all over the place, that kind of thing. Um, I'm also sensing it's difficult to instill a sense of need. So we have some community things that are driving us, like this, which is why we're here, the CC star requirements. You know, there are, there are incentives for us at research universities. And some of those same things don't exist uh, at the smaller institutions. So there's a little extra work needed to try and figure out how to justify both time from staff members and potential costs that they might incur. Um, and then they also often have expertise lacking. So some of the schools will have one or two IT people total. 
Um, and so, but yet we have, you know, NSF, for, I mean, the NSF is interested in us working with some of these smaller institutions as part of our national, our EBSCOR grant or, or other things. Um, so, and I know that there, and, you know, we were visiting before this, I was visiting with um, the Internet 2 folks, and um, there are some options technically that I think could come to bear and help here, but um, there are some fundamental issues that I think we all kind of have assumptions that we have somewhat mature identity management programs and we have a, you know, somewhat mature and well-managed password store, usually Active Directory, um, that, that we can't always make those assumptions at some of these smaller schools. So um, I think my turn with Clara was how you do it. Mine is like a warning, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> for my talk. So uh, I think that's my last slide. And is it back to Tom? Yeah, it'll come back to me. Thank okay. you. Um, but, but don't, 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 you know, don't, you're not off the hook just yet, and okay. nor Laura, I don't think. So, Mark, I'd like to kind of follow up a bit. So, you identified, if I understood you correctly, um, uh, focusing on, if you go back a slide, please, Dean, or maybe it was, uh, yeah, just one, I think. Um, so, those folks on the left, and then, yes. I'm sorry, go forward a slide again, because that's where, that's where, where Mark kind of netted out what's the, what's, what's the problem. And it's really those three bullets, right? Yes. So to, to do what research universities and others are kind of used to, it's premised on there being, as you said, a mature enough identity management program there. You've got some single sign-on and then you do some stuff to kind of, you know, quotes, plug it into in common and away you go. And if you don't have that, well, what do you do? Uh, and I'm not going to uh, delve deeply into what those alternatives are currently, just to note that there are some, as you referred to. And, and I, I believe people can write to um, help at incommon.org about those, or they can write to CI help uh, about this kind of stuff specifically. They'll, that'll, they'll, don't worry, that, that address will be on a, a slide at the end of the deck here in a minute. Um, but there's also, uh, that's been a problem that's been on the minds of many for a very long time. It's a really tough problem and it takes many different things to address. And Common is also going to be doing some more things to make more services and solutions uh, available to that better fit circumstances like that. Um, recognizing that uh, a lot of places just don't have the depth of IT staff or skills, um, that kind of stuff. It has to be pretty easy, plug and play, you know, like many um, uh, uh, commercial services, marketed as cloud services tend to be these days where what the customer needs to do is relatively modest and all the technical heavy lifting is done by the provider. Well, that, that kind of approach uh, also being uh, developed now and in common doesn't necessarily bridge the gap for everybody, but hopefully it'll take things further down, down, down the list, as it were. Um, are there, I, I wanted to make sure that, um, uh, thank you, Anne, and she put that, Anne just put into the chat that there's help at Incommon for questions like that, you know, or any questions at all about Incommon, send them there. Um, there was a question earlier in the chat about zero trust and federation. And zero trust is a, a key word these days in security uh, for the security people that roughly, and I'll, 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 I'll give sort of a definition and it's only very approximate, please forgive me, I won't encapsulate everything, but that you make no assumptions that there's no inside safe place for your campus or your user. You know, you always check every time anybody, one of yours or not, is trying to access any of your stuff, wherever it is, that you, there's some, you know, you kind of, you don't make you don't build into that process an assumption of trust uh, that, that that's you move that assumption if it's there and so there was a question well how does federation play with a, a campus that's trying to take a zero trust approach to their i guess in particular their identity and access management program and uh, in particular and there was also a reply saying well they, they actually they get along quite well together and i have to agree with that there's lots of options um there's really um I see it, that is that whenever the campus should decide it needs to authenticate someone, it does. That's part of the zero trust thing. Likewise, whenever a service out there in the world decides it needs to authenticate someone, it does. And so in a sense, they're separable. Federation uh, access policy comes from the services being accessed through Federation. Campus access policy comes from the campus managing access to its own resources. I don't think that there's anything about the technology or even anything much about the user experience that confounds those 
two distinct domains in which access management is administered by different parties. So I don't know if there may be some follow on questions that'd be okay, but basically I think we're kind of good there in terms of zero trust and identity federation. Um, I don't know if there's I any- a, I have an add on for that. Oh, please. I, could, I, I would say, I mean, you have the slide that kind of shows what the base um, like attributes to release were the, the pyramid and then the next level up had multi-factor and, and assurance in there. And I think that, um, you know, being able, participating in a federation like this, where you're only having to implement this once and you can do very high, much higher levels of identity vetting, you can actually do higher level, you know, you can rely on this identity more, which would make it easier to do zero trust in some elements, because you don't have to be as worried about this person actually maybe not is who they say they are. Uh, that's a really good point. Um, and actually, I'm not clear whether or not the zero trust uh, framework kind of goes into um, identity proofing and that kind of stuff, you know, how, how well you proof your, your people. Um, but it, it, the, the concept logically goes there, I think, Mark, for sure. Uh, and it is something, I mean, it's not news uh, at all that that's of concern. It's of concern to any party that has to manage risk needs to guard themselves against the possibility that someone logging in could do damage to someone that gives them a real, it has a very negative impact. And frankly, in the Federation world, in the RE sector, uh, I've encountered people with sensitive to those risks most frequently and earliest amongst the research and scientific collaborations. If you think about it, they tend to have very expensive, really unique gear. Um, they want that gear to be used for the purpose it was built and operated for, and not for somebody else's, you know, Bitcoin mining purpose, for example. Um, there can be real issues with taking someone's high performance computing and high network bandwidth to use as a gun to shoot at somebody else in terms of denial of service, things like that. And lots of intellectual property that um, various parties around the world would like to take, uh, give themselves a head start by stealing it from somebody else before it's been released for them to use. Uh, so there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on in the, in the research and science world that has, frankly, that's kind of why that Federated Entity Management for Research community um, pointed out those things as being critically important to them. So you're right on, Mark. Uh, all that identity proofing and MFA and stuff like that. Um, the, the drivers from the way I've encountered things come from the research community, first of all, uh, in terms of imbuing those qualities into federation. I was, Pam just wanted to say, you know, when people are thinking about, I'm assuming a, a lot of uh, uh, attendees of this, uh, of this webinar are thinking about CC Star Awards. And I think one of the things that maybe we didn't communicate effectively enough is uh, the CC Star Awards are really a great way for central IT people to get in touch with researchers and really try to understand what are the issues that they're facing and how, you know, what are the tools that they can bring to help them address those issues. So I think, you know, as we are discussing zero trust or, or some, you know, securing research environments or, you know, enabling research in, you know, uh, in, in different areas. I think this, you know, the first step in any CC star award is really understanding the researchers and getting a, a nucleus of researchers that you can work with in order to be able to propose that grant, unless you have, you know, a unique circumstance uh, such as what Mark is describing. So, I, you know, I think it's great to talk about this in abstract, but I think getting in touch with the researchers on campus is really key. Thanks, Clara, for reminding us of that. Absolutely. It's also one of the most fun things you can do for central IT. You know, sometimes we, we get green skin out of the sunlight back in the back room, in the dark room with all the windows closed. And it's nice to get out and recognize what the campus actually looks like and what folks do out there. And that's, that's a lot of... It's nice to connect the dots about how what we do in central IT actually enables some of the cool stuff that our faculty and students are doing, or can be enable if we work with them towards that end. Um, I'm not sure if that, I don't know that I saw other questions. Um, and I see a comment from Scott Cantor from the Shipworth Project. Um, so not sure that he's, he's bought into what this zero trust stuff is, at least not as a, uh, as a sort of a marketing as a brand. Uh, maybe some of its elements that get rolled up under their marketeers, we'll see. Um, I don't know if folks have any other questions for Clara or Mark or for myself for that matter. 
or for, for that matter, for Captain Maroney or Ann West, who are also online, who kind of are responsible for all this stuff um, uh, that is in common. But we have a few minutes left if you'd like to, to um, ask those questions. And I'll give just a few moments of, of, um, of uncomfortable silence to see if the, that rings out any further questions from you. So Anne writes here in the chat about the um, Refed's MFA profile. And there's more you can read there on the Refed's site. Okay. Um, well, I don't hear any other questions, especially for our CIOs here, which would be um, for, for on behalf of the other ones that are attending. But uh, so uh, if you would, uh, Dean, advance the slide. And um, so there's um, a link to a resource on in common site that takes you to uh, all the a bunch of material that does a much more thorough job than I just did in 10 minutes at the beginning of this hour in breaking down what that CC star requirement means and how you go about doing it. So that resource is, is all linked in there. And please, if you have, if you're doing that and you have any question, or if you're not even sure how to get going, write ci-plan-help at incommon.org. Ann and I and some others will receive that and we'd love to help you. Just like Clara was saying, we really like to help engage with folks. It, you know, it's always, that's the most fun part of what we do. Uh, twiddling dials and working with technology is, uh, you know, is, it can be fun too, but it's nice to see how it all works out and things, real things in the real world get accomplished for the academy. And so connecting with you guys at least helps us see those links and uh, hopefully help you do your role in that, do your part in enabling that uh, academic collaboration too. Well, you know, I, I always think that a short meeting is, a, is an especially good one. And um, so I'm happy. Uh, unless Clara or Mark, you have any other thoughts that have come to your mind? Okay, well, let's call it a day. Thanks folks very much for your attention and everyone have a great day.